Throughout history, there have been some big questions that have been asked. Maybe you remember some of those big questions. Romeo, Romeo, wherefore art thou Romeo? To be or not to be? How many licks does it take to get to the Tootsie Roll center of a Tootsie Pop? Can you hear me now? All of those are pretty big questions. We're only concerned about one thing today though, and that is what is the big question in the Bible? The big question in the Bible is, what must I do to be saved? That's what the whole Bible is about. If the Bible doesn't answer that fundamental question, how do I get right with the Lord? How do I avoid that eternal destiny of punishment that awaits me? If the Bible doesn't answer that question, then it doesn't help us a whole lot. The big question in the Bible is, what must I do to be saved? That question has been asked for thousands of years. And if the Lord delays His return, it will be asked for a thousand more years. It's being asked today. And many people give different answers to this same most important, most vital question. I think that's dangerous when we see different answers to a really important question. Most people answer the question kind of similarly. I mean, kind of the same. Almost everyone believes that one must hear about Jesus, believe that He's the Son of God, confess with their mouths that belief, and even repent of their sins. Tragically though, that is where the agreement ends. Most of the world teaches that after doing those things and then saying something they call the sinner's prayer, one is saved. However, I want to show you in our lesson today that this is not what the Bible teaches about salvation. Have you ever come into the house filthy and sweaty from working outside? Maybe you've been cutting the grass and, and weed eating around the house and you've got that grass stuck all over your legs and, and you've got it in your hair. Maybe you've been at ball practice and come in just, just filthy, dirty. And you come in and, and you know how hot and sweaty you are, but as you walk into the kitchen, you smell wonderful smells coming out of that kitchen. You look in and there's a very welcoming sight of a table that is set. There's dishes there and you can smell the bread in the oven. And at the head of each plate is a big glass of iced tea and as hot and as filthy and as dirty you are, the first thing that you want to do is grab that tea and begin to drink it. But before you can get into the kitchen, your mother stops you. And she says, oh no, where do you think you're going? You're not coming in here until you're cleaned up. We're having company tonight and I want you to be presentable. I'm not going to have you sitting here all hot and sweaty and dirty. So you go into the bathroom. You get that bar of soap and man, you are just scrubbing as hard as you can scrub. And you notice all that dirt and dust coming off of you. You're having to, to scrub way up here on your arms because you're just so filthy. You wash your face and that little taste of sweat gets in your mouth and you're trying to keep the water and soap from getting in your mouth. And You're just amazed by all of that dirt that's going down that sink. You then put some cold water on the back of your neck and, and your towel dry off and maybe you lose your t-shirt and you put a new t-shirt on and you just feel so much better. That time you just spent in the bathroom at that bathroom sink with that bar of soap and that towel, it accomplished some important things for you. Just think about it for a minute. First of all, it cleaned away the dirt and the grime that was on your skin. Second, it refreshed and it invigorated you. It made you feel like you were uh, great again. It made you feel clean. You were so excited to be clean and you felt cool and relaxed and refreshed. It made you a presentable part of the family. Somebody who your mother or dad wouldn't be ashamed to say, Hey, here he is. Here she is. Straight from cleaning up. Don't you look nice? and it allowed you access to all the blessings of that family table. Only upon being cleaned and refreshed and made presentable could you then sit down there at your place and 
drink that tea and share that great meal. Baptism accomplishes in a similar way many of those same things that we've already talked about. And we're going to show from the Bible how it accomplishes those things. Baptism, first of all, cleans away the dirt and grime of sin. Just like that dirt that's washed off your hands, baptism does that to your soul. It refreshes and invigorates us by giving us a new life in Christ. We start at that point living a new life with Him. It gives us an identity as a member of God's family. We are at that point recognized as a child of God, as one of His heirs, as a joint heir with Christ. And we see around us our brothers and sisters in Christ, all of whom we have when we become a part of God's family through baptism. And lastly, baptism gives us access to all the blessings that God offers His children. And certainly we know that those blessings are abundant. We want those blessings that God holds out to us. And I'm going to show you from the scriptures today that baptism is the point at which all of those things occur. Well, if the Bible teaches that baptism does all those things, and we're going to find out together today that it does in fact teach that, we should acknowledge and teach that it is an absolutely necessary part of our salvation. I mean, not an important part, not an optional part, but a part that is absolutely necessary. I mean, how many times would the Bible have to say it before we would recognize it as a necessity? I mean, if we could prove that the Bible taught that baptism accomplishes all of those things, would we then acknowledge its necessity in our salvation? I hope we would because that is in all reality what the Bible teaches. Unfortunately, most of the religious world does not believe and teach that baptism is necessary. Many will admit that it is important, but there are very few who teach that it is essential or necessary. Even more sad than that is the fact that there are those who claim to be members of the church of Christ today who are teaching that baptism is not necessary. This should shock and alarm every faithful Christian. Chances are you're going to hear some of this teaching. Maybe you'll read it in books. Maybe you'll hear it on the radio. Maybe you'll go somewhere and someone will say some things that indicate to you that, yeah, baptism's important, but it's really not necessary. And after all, we shouldn't teach that that's what the Bible says because other groups don't teach that. And we don't want to make anybody feel uncomfortable. So we shouldn't teach that it's necessary. Or even if we believe it's necessary, we shouldn't force our belief on somebody else. Folks, we're not forcing our belief on anybody. All we're doing is studying to see what the Word of God has to say and then taking hold of the responsibility that God has given us to teach and proclaim this Word. And every faithful Christian who hears anybody suggest that baptism is not necessary should be alert about false teaching. They should be willing to defend the Bible truth about baptism. Let me give you one specific example of such false teaching. And I don't like to name names, but the fact is sometimes you've got to make a specific point. You've got to give a specific example. Because folks are going to say, uh, who's, who's saying this? Who's, who's teaching this? Well, you probably recognize the name Max Licato. Max is a wonderful author who has written many good books. And I've been reading them for many years. And I've benefited from most of them. You may not know, however, that Max Lucado is associated with the Church of Christ. Now, I'm not trying to bash or belittle Max with what I'm about to share with you. In fact, these are public statements that he made. And I'm just conveying to you the words that he said in a very public format, the radio. And these public statements reflect his belief in baptism that also reflects a growing and dangerous trend. 
These statements were made on his radio address in KJAK in Lubbock, Texas. Please listen closely. Here's what he said. Just call Him Father. Just turn your heart to Him right now as I am speaking. Call Him Father and your Father will respond. Why don't you do that? Father, I give my heart to You. I give You my sins. I give You my tears. I give You my fears. I give You my whole life. I accept the gift of Your Son on the cross for my sins. And I ask You, Father, to receive me as your child. Through Jesus I pray. Amen. Well, certainly that prayer asks some good things of the Lord. And yet there are many things that aren't said in that prayer. And this is certainly not what the Bible teaches about what we're commanded to do to be saved. In fact, after this, an announcer came on and said, And friend, if you prayed along with Max Lucado just now here on Upwards, we want to welcome you into the family of God. How can you welcome somebody into the family of God who has not done what the Bible says you must do to get into the family of God? After some more announcements and advertisements, another announcer said, Max Locato returns with a special word for those who have received the gift of salvation just moments ago in prayer. The problem with that is that the Bible never teaches of one person who became a New Testament Christian by receiving the gift of salvation just moments ago in prayer. It's simply not the Bible truth. And yet it is being taught by some of the most visual, some of the most vocal, and some of the most prominent teachers in our country today. In fact, when Max Lucado came back on, he himself said, I want to encourage you to find a church. I want to encourage you to be baptized. I want to encourage you to read your Bible. But I don't want you to do any of that so that you will be saved. I want you to do all of that because you are saved. Well, how did that person to whom he is speaking get saved? By saying a prayer? That's not what the Bible teaches. Now, notice that he mentions baptism in that quote there, and that is to appease many people who would say, Well, aren't you saying that baptism is not important? He would say, No, no. Baptism is very important. But what he's not saying is that baptism is necessary when in fact that is exactly what the Bible says. This is just one example among many of false teaching that's being promoted. It is sad to hear and read about false teaching and we need to be able to recognize it when we hear it. But we only recognize false teaching when we can learn and identify the truth. Let me ask you to do an exercise with me. How do you know a brown recluse spider when you see one? Well, there are a couple of different ways that you could have learned to identify a brown recluse spider. The first way that you could do it is to study 30,000 different species of bugs that we call spiders. You could learn what every one of those 30,000 look like and then you would say, well, I know that's not a brown recluse because that's a, you know, an eight-legged whatchamacallit. And so if you knew the name of 30 different thousand spiders, then you would know what a brown recluse looks like. But don't you think there might be a faster way to learning what a brown recluse looks like? Don't you think if you just studied what a real brown recluse looks like, you wouldn't have to study the 30,000 different types of spiders? Here's what I'm suggesting to you. There are many, many false teachings in the world. You don't have to know about every single false teaching. You only have to know one thing. You only have to know the truth. Because if you know the truth, then you'll recognize that anything else is false teaching. So what we're going to do in the next few minutes that we have is to see what the Bible says about baptism. To see what God Himself says about baptism. Because when it comes down to it, if I were you, I wouldn't be so worried about what Max Lucado says about baptism. I wouldn't even be so worried about what Stan Butt says about baptism. The only thing that should matter to you is what God says about baptism. 
And we know what God says about baptism because He has given us His Word and I'm thankful that He has. First, the Bible teaches that baptism is necessary for our salvation. Not a good idea, not an important symbol, not an option, not important, but necessary. The very first time the gospel was preached, it was preached in Acts chapter 2 on the day of Pentecost. There were a group of people gathered from all parts of the world and they came to gather to worship in Jerusalem. They heard a sermon by one of the apostles, Peter. And when he finished his sermon about Jesus and about the fact that many of them had condemned and crucified the Son of God, it says they were cut to the heart and they asked a question. Oh, here we are on important questions again. Here's what they said. Men and brethren, what shall we do? What must we do? Notice the urgency implicit in that question. What shall we do? What must we do? What do you command us? What are you going to tell us? If we had been present on Pentecost, we could have heard what they heard. We could have heard the lesson. We could have heard the question. We might have even asked the question. And in asking that question, we would have heard exactly the same answer that Peter gave. And thank the Lord we have it recorded for us in the pages of of the New Testament. Peter said this in Acts chapter 2 verse 37 and 38. Now when they heard this, they were cut to the heart and said to Peter and the rest of the apostles, Men and brethren, what shall we do? Then Peter said to them, Repent and let every one of you be baptized in the name of Jesus Christ for the remission of sins. Now let me get you to think about something before we move on. And that's this. There are those who would argue that baptism is not necessary for salvation and they would quote several scriptures out of context and they would talk about several other things. But I want you to remember that when Peter told these people on the day of Pentecost, the very first time the gospel was preached, that they needed to repent and be baptized in the name of Jesus Christ, they couldn't say, well, what about what Paul said over here? You know, or what about what was written here? None of the New Testament was written yet. When Peter says, repent and let every one of you be baptized in the name of Jesus Christ, it was an unequivocal command. There was no, well, I don't know if I agree with that or not, Peter. They didn't say that. Those who received his word didn't debate about the necessity of baptism. They simply did what Peter told them to do. In 1 Peter chapter 3 and verse 21, there's also an interesting verse. Peter says this, There is also an antitype which now saves us. Guess what it is? Baptism. Not the removal of the filth of the flesh, but the answer of a good conscience toward God through the resurrection of Jesus Christ. I have been studying with people and I've asked them to read this verse before and they've read it like this. There is an antitype which does not save us. And I'll say, read it again. And they'll read it again because this verse very clearly teaches us that baptism saves us. And folks, if the Bible tells us that baptism saves us, then I'm not interested in what any other man says. I just want to do what the Bible says. I may not understand everything about it completely, but I know enough to know that the Bible teaches that it is necessary If Peter told those on Pentecost they needed to be baptized to be saved and then later told us that baptism saves us, why and how are there those who teach that baptism is not necessary for salvation? Those who teach that are not teaching the truth. We need to be aware of them. We need to answer them. We need to teach the truth about baptism. And that truth is what the Bible says about it. Next, the Bible teaches that baptism is the point where we contact the blood of Jesus that washes our sins away. 1 Corinthians chapter 15 and the first several verses of that great chapter talks about the gospel of Jesus Christ. 
It sums up the gospel of Jesus in saying that Jesus lived, He died, He was buried, and He was raised again. That's the gospel. In a very real way, baptism acts out that gospel. You know, there are all kinds of stains in the world and there are all kinds of stain removers. Bleach will remove some stains and vinegar will get other stains out. There are stain sticks and stain wipes. Sometimes if you want to get a stain out, you've got to put ice on it. And some even suggest that peanut butter gets out stains. But the worst stain in the world is not a stain that's on any piece of carpet, not on any rug, not on any piece of clothes, but the worst stain of all is on our souls. It is the stain of sin and there is only one thing in the universe that can remove it, the precious blood of our Lord Jesus. It is through baptism that we gain access to that cleansing blood. Acts chapter 2 and verse 38 that we've already looked at says this, Repent and let every one of you be baptized in the name of Jesus Christ for the remission of sins. Saul of Tarsus, who would later be known as the Apostle Paul, was commanded, Arise and be baptized and wash away your sins. Acts 22, 16. Third, the Bible teaches that baptism is the point at which we begin a new life with Christ. Just like it washes our sins away, it also marks a certain stage in where we are spiritually. Look at the following verses. First, in John chapter 3, verses 3 through 5, Jesus was teaching a man by the name of Nicodemus who came to him by night. Now, interestingly, John 3.16 is one of those verses that many people will cite to say that the, the Bible says you can be saved without being baptized. Well, folks, whoever tells you John 3.16 teaches that has not read John 3. John 3, where Jesus taught Nicodemus, has some interesting and fascinating things to teach us about salvation. Jesus here says, unless one is born again, he cannot see the kingdom of God. Nicodemus was confused and asked, How can a man be born when he is old? Jesus replied, Unless one is born of water and the Spirit, he cannot enter the kingdom of God. Romans chapter 6, verses 3 and 4, we mentioned 1 Corinthians 15 and, and what the gospel was, the life, the death, the burial, and the resurrection of Jesus and how through baptism we participate in that gospel. We reenact that gospel. Romans 6, verses 3 and 4 tells us that. It says, Or do you not know that as many of us as were baptized into Christ Jesus were baptized into His death? Therefore, we were buried with Him through baptism into death that just as Christ was raised from the dead by the glory of the Father, even so we also should walk in newness of life. Interestingly, this verse not only talks about the necessity of baptism, but it also talks about the method of baptism. There's not any sprinkling. There's not any pouring. It is a burial where one goes down in that watery grave and only after they're buried, can they be raised to walk in newness of life? Colossians chapter 2 verses 12 through 13 echoes that idea. When Paul is writing to the Colossians, he says, Buried with Him in baptism, in which you also were raised with Him through faith in the working of God, who raised Him from the dead, and you being dead in your trespasses, He is made alive together with Him, having forgiven you all trespasses. Through baptism we share in Christ's death. We share in His burial. And praise the Lord, we share in His resurrection. We cannot be saved unless we stop living a life of sin and start living a life with Christ. The Bible teaches that baptism is the point at which our old lives end and our new life begins. Finally, the Bible teaches that baptism is how we get into Christ. You know, in Noah's day, salvation was found only in one place. It was found in the ark. In Moses' day, during the tenth plague on Egypt, salvation was only found where there was blood on the doorpost. In our day, salvation 
is still only found in one place. It's found in Christ. Ephesians chapter 1 and 2 tell us of the great blessings of being in Christ. Paul knew that being in Christ was absolutely the most important thing. He said, I also count all things lost for the excellence of the knowledge of Christ Jesus my Lord for whom I have suffered the loss of all things and count them as rubbish that I may gain Christ and be found in Him. Philippians 3 verses 8 and 9. If being in Christ is the most important place for us to be, do you want to know how to get there? Well, Galatians chapter 3 verse 27 tells us. It says, For as many of you as were baptized into Christ have put on Christ. That's it. Did you miss it? It's simple and it's powerful, but it's scriptural. We get into Christ through baptism. And in Christ is definitely where we want to be. Even though there are many who teach that baptism is not necessary for salvation, this is not the Bible truth. The Bible teaches that baptism accomplishes important things for us through the death and resurrection of Christ. The preaching of the apostles clearly shows that baptism is necessary for salvation. The Bible teaches that baptism is the point at which we contact the blood of Jesus that washes our sins away. The Bible teaches that baptism is the point at which our new life with Christ begins. And the Bible teaches that baptism is how we get into Christ. Even though there are those who teach that baptism is not necessary for salvation, this is not what the Bible teaches. Let's teach and defend what the Bible teaches. Let's be aware that false teaching is there and continually study and affirm our commitment to the true Bible teaching about baptism.